So good morning, um, or good afternoon actually, we're on the verge there. Um, it's a pleasure to um, come back for um, a lecture with I think a sort of a seasonal topic as you'll see, um, <laughs> the creation of the universe, okay, that at least is a sort of a tentative title. Okay, so where does all this begin? Where there was um, a guy called Lemaitre, Georges Lemaitre, who was um, an ordained Catholic priest. Um, and he made a major discovery, which I'm going to be telling you about. But this is a, a quotation from one of his books. The evolution of the world can be compared to a display of fireworks that has just ended. Some few red wisps, ashes and smoke. Standing on a cold cinder, we see the slow fading of the suns, and we try to recall the vanished brilliance of the origin of the world. So... Um, uh, it's a wonderful quote, and Lemaitre, you know, was really the father of the Big Bang, as I'll try to explain. But what is the Big Bang? It's something that we can't really prove actually occurred. Um, uh, there's a theory, and I'll describe some of that, and there's lots of um, circumstantial evidence. And, you know, we, we routinely uh, condemn people um, um, on the basis of circumstantial evidence, right? I mean, it's considered to be... Um, uh, fairly robust if you have enough of it. Um, of course, um, there are no proofs. Uh, it's very hard to prove anything, actually, in science. You can make something probably uh, true. You can increase probability, but you can never be 100% certain of anything, actually. That's one of the lessons we, lo we learn from physics. But you can, you know, at 99.99% or whatever, that's pretty good. Um, and so there's a high probability, probability that the Big Bang happened, um, and you can compare it to uh, other issues. We all believe in um, that matter consists of electrons and protons, and protons consist of quarks, subatomic, subnuclear particles. But no one has actually ever seen these things, right? But there's very strong evidence they exist. Okay, so that's sort of a general um, preamble here. So cosmology and the story of the Big Bang uh, has an amazing cast of very international characters. Um, and I'm going to mostly focus on one of them, um, um, Georges Lemaitre, um, who um, was having a discussion with Einstein in 1931, where Einstein um, really conceded, after having resisted for several years, that Lemaitre had a wonderful new explanation uh, for the universe, the expansion of the universe. And the man who provided some of the key data, but never acknowledged Lemaitre um, uh, as having um, uh, views on the subject prior to his, actually, um, is known for the law of expansion of the universe, although he never actually believed the universe was expanding. He just found a correlation between um, velocities of nebulae and their distance, but the interpretation of velocity was some a little bit obscured, still is at the time. It's not directly velocity. It's the redshift, as we call it. And then in this cast of international characters, there was a Russian who also had an idea, even before the Metro, but never really made any connection with the real universe. Um, and um, there was an Englishman, Eddington, who was responsible, really, for having the Metro's article translated from an obscure journal in French, uh, in the, when he lived in Belgium, into English, and that really made a huge difference. Um, at the same time, a Dutchman, William de Sitter, played a major role in also propagating the work of Lemaitre. And then, a little bit later, um, the main evidence for all of this came about um, with work by um, a, a Russian um, who went to live in the States, George Gamow, and then to Americans, Robert Wilson and Penzias, who made a major discovery of the fossil radiation from the Big Bang. Okay, so who actually was this person, Georges Lemaitre? So he was born in 1894 in Charleroi, Belgium. He trained in engineering and mathematics. He um, enrolled in the First World War as an artillery engineer. And he was very critical of the range finding of um, the, the, the gunners that he worked with. And for that, he never actually was promoted to being an officer. He remained an NCO um, during the war. Then afterwards, he um, had a vocation to go to become a priest. His father insisted that um, he take his time, actually, um, because um, he wanted to be sure he really, his father advised him to be really sure that's what he wanted to do. And so he went into a seminary where they encouraged people with delayed vocations to enter, okay? 
And the seminary was run by a very forward-looking um, cardinal at the time, who later became Cardinal Carl Mercier, who allowed Lemaitre to study Einstein's theory of gravity in the seminary. As well. And also, he studied Chinese. And other. He was an interesting person who studied many things. Uh, he, he was ordained in 1923 as, as a priest. Okay. Okay, then um, he obtained a bursary to go to, work, to Cambridge to work with Arthur Eddington, who was director of the observatory in Cambridge at the time, um, a famous astronomer, one of the very few people in the world who actually understood Einstein's theory of gravity. Um, um, and um, he, that's, in fact, where Lemaitre got very familiar with the ideas of, um, of cosmology, one of the applications of gravity theory. And then he got a grant, another grant, to go to the States, to Harvard, to work with um, Harlow Shapley, a famous astronomer, in 1924-25. And at the same time, he got a PhD at MIT, a neighboring institution in general relativity. And so with Shapley, Shapley was the major player in those years for trying to understand the distance to what were called the nebulae, these spiral nebulae seen with the telescopes of the time. I had no idea whether they were, you know, small satellites of our galaxy or really very far away, intrinsic Milky Ways in themselves, huge things, but so far away they looked very tiny on the sky. And... Um, and so Lemaitre obviously became convinced of the distant nature of these, of these objects. And then, um, briefly, um, in the course of that year, he went to Pasadena to meet um, people like Hubble, who was the eminent astronomer of the time, um, studying these distant nebulae and measuring their distances, and other, other cosmologists well-known. Then he, went, um, he also went to Arizona, to Lowell Observatory, where he met an astronomer called Vesto Slipher, who was the first person to measure the red shifts, now red shifts are Doppler shifts seen in the optical spectrum. They tell us the speeds of the galaxies. They were, and Slipher noticed that the vast predominance of the distant nebulae were moving away from us. You know, why would they move away from us? No one had the slightest idea at the time, but Lemaitre learned all about that. Um, and then he went back to Louvain to join the faculty in 1925. Okay, so in the next two years, he developed a new theory of the universe. And his idea was that he could explain um, the fact the galaxies mostly seem to be moving away if the universe was expanding. And so in 1927, he published um, a paper on that um, in French. Um, and um, it was only um, two years later that Hubble published his relation between distance and redshift, which has become known since then as the Hubble Law, which sets the basis for the expanding universe. Um, but Hubble um, was a, you know, an observer's observer, really, a practical person who did not believe um, that the redshift necessarily meant expansion of the universe. So he never really believed in expansion of space. But that was core to what Lemaitre realised. And Einstein, too, refused to accept this at the time because Einstein, like almost everyone else at that epoch could not believe the universe was expanding, space was expanding. It just seemed so natural to have a static universe. And so, uh, uh, but it didn't take very long um, for Einstein and Lemaitre to get together once um, Hubble, once um, this should be Lemaitre's paper, was, was published in, in English. And then they, they did this lecture tour in California and you saw um, a picture of the two together. Um, and um, Lemaitre later, later became an advisor to Pope Pius XII, um, who was the nuncio in Germany during just before the, the Second World War and a close acquaintance of Hitler, etc., and then um, became Pope later, um, and um, the better later became president of the sciences. Okay, so here we are. Um, um, Einstein changed his mind, okay? 1931, when they were doing their lecture tour of California. So Einstein had said in 1927, when the Metro explained his ideas, your calculations are correct, but your physics is atrocious. Okay? Um, that was quite a, you know, a rebuke from Einstein, the most famous physicist in the world, the Metro, this young, you know, uh, astrophysicist just beginning, a mathematician just beginning to, to make his way in the world to be told that. But it didn't take very long. And it was only after Hubble published his data that the world accepted this amazing realization the universe was not static. And Hubble said, after hearing the Metro talk, this is the most beautiful and satisfactory explanation of creation to which I have ever listened. Well, there you are. So things can change, OK? Um, and it's remarkable that Einstein was you know, so willing to accept new things, too. OK? 
that, that also, I think, says a lot. You know, there are, there are some physicists today who would never accept a new idea like this, would just keep on finding ways to tweak their old ideas. And, um, but Einstein actually was very forward-looking in that way. Okay, so um, let me then tell you a little about um, this um, theory and the, modern, and the modern version of it um, based on Lemaitre's ideas. And um, so here we are. Um, the universe is expanding. That means it takes a certain time to get to where it is. And that time is you measure from the rate of expansion the, the velocities of the galaxies. They will all come from a certain point 13.8 billion years ago. Huge elapse of time, okay? Um, <clears throat> our Milky Way galaxy was formed um, uh, way back, about 13 billion years ago. And if I track back in time, then I expect there was an epoch uh, 200 years after the beginning um, when the first galaxies were forming. Before then, uh, there's an epoch I'm going to tell you something about. When we, when we look with our biggest radio telescopes, and uh, smaller ones too, actually, they don't need to be so powerful, we can see um, sort of a fog, basically, that comes from 380,000 years after the Big Bang, a fog of microwaves on the sky that is actually the fossil radiation from the Big Bang. And before then, uh, there was um, a period, still somewhat mysterious, but we call it inflation, where the universe expanded rapidly and, uh, and accounted for its enormous size now and um, much of the structure it has. Okay, so that's, that's an outline of, of the theory. Let me emphasize that what we really only observe directly are the galaxies around us, maybe glimpses of the first stars, and some of this radiation, which is coming to us from you know, a long time after all of this, which is not seen directly. But the interesting thing about doing this sort of um, physics of what we see is there are fossils left behind. So there are indications, very strong ones, that the universe really did do much as this theory tells us it should have done in the first seconds after the Big Bang, okay? And so we have strong evidence that, that really did occur. And I call these fossils of the past. And so here are um, uh, the most important ones, okay? So we, we first discovered the element helium in the sun, okay? And then 30 years later, we found it on the Earth. Amazing, really, 19th century discovery. Um, and so helium is the second most abundant element in the universe after hydrogen. Um, and there is so much helium in stars that it cannot have been produced by the stars themselves. We know that stars make their, their, their energy source, they shine because of the fusion of hydrogen into helium, um, which one day may be an energy source that we can use in you know, civil re type reactors, civil engineering built reactors on the Earth. We haven't done it. We're a long way from that so far. But it works in the sun, but it doesn't make enough helium. So the helium came from before stars were formed, we think, from the Big Bang. Then there's the fossil radiation, which we observe with microwave, in microwaves, which comes, it's a, it's a faint relic of the hot universe at the beginning. Then there's the stuff that we're made of, ordinary matter, we call that baryons. Um, this was produced fractions of a second after the, in the, after the beginning. Um, that's what the theory says. Again, it's hard to have any direct proof. I'll give you one example later on. And then there are the older stars in the Milky Way, which tell us um, even about stars that um, don't exist now, but that exploded and, and fed those stars with some elements that we see in them. And they tell us about conditions, you know, t 10 billion years ago. So let me begin um, with... Um, uh, one important development, the helium story, the second most abundant element measured first in the sun. And this came about because um, in the 1940s, um, George Gamow, who was a nuclear physicist by, by training, realized that the um, cosmology, the universe, was a great way to apply some of his ideas about nuclear reactions, making elements, fusion reactions. Um, because the Big Bang was like a perfect reactor. Um, it was very hot. And he, he believed um, that, um, uh, along with his student, um, um, that um, uh, th th there would be, um, one could explain the heavy elements of the Big Bang. And this was actually the most famous paper he wrote, but Gamow was a practical joker. And so Hans Bethe, who was a famous nuclear physicist who never worked on cosmology at all, but was the founder of the arguments that stars produce helium, he added Beta's name to the paper to come up with, you know, Alpha, Beta, Gamow, a sort of a <laughs> classical joke. 
But it was truly a very important paper, okay? And in that paper, the idea was in the first half an hour or less, all of the... Um, he thought all of the elements could be produced. In fact, he later realised that helium was the major thing that was produced from the Big Bang. Um, okay. Um, and so why was this um, so important? Well, it turns out if I take four protons, I can make one helium nucleus. So that happens in the middle of the sun. And, and the four protons um, weigh um, slightly more than the helium nucleus. And so there's a mass difference. And by, by Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared, about 7%, the, it's 7 the mass difference of the, of, between these, the protons and the helium, that comes out in pure energy. Okay. And so that's the source of thermonuclear energy. That is, say, one day we'll be able to use all the oceans, or a tiny fraction of them, to turn hydrogen, they full of H2O, into helium and have an inexhaustible energy source on the Earth. We're not quite there yet, um, but that is a prediction that many people think we'll be doing in 100 years' time, and that presumably in is clean energy because we're not using any radioactive elements um, as with nuclear fission. And then, um, but in the early universe this happened, and the way, so the way this works is you have protons, um, you make a little bit of heavy hydrogen, that's deuterium, uh, and slightly heavier hydrogen, that's tritium, and then eventually you make helium. So that's the sort of, they merge together under great heat. Okay, um, and we call this process a, a ladder in the sense that you start off with protons and, and a few neutrons as well, and they build their way up to helium, and you can make traces of other elements, okay? So one of the most important ones you make is lithium, and you make deuterium, that's what the D stands for. And in principle, these are left over, you can see them in stars, and we believe they also came from the Big Bang, because all the stars that we know about, um, they burn up deuterium. They make a bit, but they burn it up, so it never survives. But the Big Bang would have made it, and in gas clouds in the universe that have not been inside stars yet, you would see traces left over. So not only do we see this, this huge amount of helium, which is the same everywhere we look, which we think came from the Big Bang, but we see traces of deuterium and lithium. So Gamow's dream rapidly came to an end, though, because it, you can, we call this a ladder, building your way up to heavier and heavier nuclei. It turned out that you want to go up to beryllium, which is the next one, before you can go any further. And it so happens that... Um, um, beryllium-8, which is the stable um, uh, nucleus you want to get to, um, this element is just totally unstable, okay? Um, and, and it means it's like going up a ladder and the rung is broken, so you can't go any further. And so you couldn't work your way up to carbon, which is, consists of three helium elements, of, of, um, which makes mass 12. You're stuck at mass 8, basically. That's the end of the ladder. And so... Um, now, we know how to get around that problem. The reason we're here is because the carbon in our bodies and everything else was made inside stars. And stars, you know, are static. They sit there for a lot long enough time to get around this broken ladder problem. But nevertheless, helium was a great piece of evidence for the Big Bang. But there were people that couldn't accept this. And maybe the most famous one was Fred Hoyle. And so in a, in a broadcast at the BBC in 1951... He, um, he just made fun of the Big Bang Theory. Okay? He said it was just crazy to imagine that we began. And he preferred a, a universe that was um, never changing on the average. He invented the steady state universe where as things move away, new stuff comes up to replace them and turns into galaxies. So they created out of nothing in his view. Um, but if, if he were right, then of course, when you look far away with big telescopes, you should see the same as we see locally. And in the 1950s, there was a dispute that went on for a decade, and Hoyle finally lost, which was that, you know, the, in the, radio, the radio astronomers, Martin Ryle in particular, began seeing um, evidence of vast numbers of radio sources far away, distant galaxies, which we'd never expect to see in the steady state theory. Things should be about the same. OK, so that leaves us with the question, then, of where did all the chemical elements come from? We have helium, trace amounts, and we'll do other things from the Big Bang, but what about the rest of it? What about the stuff that we're made of? And so the answer came around the same time, um, and Fred Hoyle was a major participant in this aspect of the theory, um, and that it was simply exploding stars. So imagine a star that's... Um, 20 times the mass of our sun. The sun will not do this. The sun will not be a great producer of many, many elements, but a really heavy star will be because it burns up its helium, which it makes from hydrogen, into heavier stuff, and the sun will never do that. And so in this heavy star of 20 times the mass of the sun, it 
has a lot of hydrogen, that turned into helium, and then the star collapsed a bit, heated up, made carbon, heated up some more, and eventually got to iron. Iron is sort of the ultimate slag heap of the universe. There's no more energy you could extract from burning iron. You're stuck there. So basically, you end up with an iron star, a pure iron star at the end of the day, but in the meantime of the thing collapsing to iron, everything explodes. Okay, and so all the outer layers explode and you're left with this dense, compact thing, which is actually what we call a neutron star, um, which essentially is like one giant iron nucleus almost. Okay, anyway, all this explosion then of all these elements creates, um, this eventually settles inside clouds, which make stars and planets. And so that, there, there we have the story of cosmic evolution. Here you see um, Hoyle um, along with, um, uh, this is a very sort of Anglo-Saxon uh, glance on things, but these are the Elizabeth and Jeffrey Burbage, along with Hoyle and Willie Fowler, the one, the one American, who basically argued that um, not, you didn't have the Big Bang, but you had all these other, other ingredients, um, um, mostly stars and exploding stars, which build your way up the periodic table to all, all of these complicated elements. Um, okay, so um, Fowler was a great amateur of um, model trains, and they, I think they're presenting him for a birthday with a model train there. Okay. So um, that is the chemical history of the universe. Um, so the other thing that um, we have now, we're now achieving with modern astronomy is that by building the biggest telescopes, we can look back very far. So can we directly try to prove any of this by seeing how things were far away and therefore far back in time? Because in principle, if, if this sort of picture is right, that the heavy elements are made by successions of exploding stars, when you look back very far away, you should see chemically primitive stuff. You know, you should see this evolution in the sky, right? So that would be a nice test of the theory. And so we've built a whole series of wonderful telescopes. Um, one of them um, looked in the infrared because you can see further. Dust doesn't get in the way. Um, another looked at high energy photons, gamma rays. Imagine the X-rays, we have to go to space to do this. Another telescope... Um, uh, in space where the um, seeing is particularly good, very clear. You can get above the atmosphere and you can, again, see distant things, the Hubble Space Telescope. And, um, and then the final example is the microwave telescopes, which can look for the fossil radiation of the Big Bang. These are all satellites, are all very successful, all currently operating in getting us images of the universe. So let me show you some of the images of the universe that these essentially time machines, because they, by looking far away, one is looking back, you know, the light travel, light's been traveling for millions or billions of years to us, so we're looking back in time and we see these things. And so here, for example, is this infrared telescope, which has produced this catalog of, of um, these are galaxies. This is, the, this is the Milky Way, as seen in the infrared, and you see sort of a, something like a million galaxies on the sky. And um, many of these are, you know, billions of light years back in time, um, uh, billions of light years, that's a distance measure, billions of years back in time, billions of light years away from us. So that is what the sky will look like if you look um, um, to try to capture as many galaxies as you can. Here's another view. Um, this is the sky as seen in gamma rays. Now, th th this is, you may, is a peculiar thing to do, but the high energy universe captures... Um, the violent parts of galaxies. So in this, you know, our galaxy is full of stars. They emit most of the light from the galaxy. But in the very centre of our galaxy, there's a black hole, a fairly massive black hole, which um, is seen in X-rays and gamma rays and produces cosmic rays, very energetic radiation. So that's a whole other view of the universe, the violent part of the universe. And when you look back far away, you see a lot more, more interesting black holes, more controlling more massive ones than in our own galaxy. So here's a gamma ray view of the universe. Here's the Milky Way, which is also glowing somewhat in gamma rays because it's the cosmic rays, the particles that hit the gas, give you gamma radiation. But each of these are, are basically things that we call quasars, essentially massive black holes, stuff is falling on them, giving you lots of gamma rays. So the universe contains not just ordinary galaxies, but more exotic things powered by black holes. And then going um, to my final example, um, when we look at the Hubble Space Telescope, with the Hubble Space Telescope, so it stared at one point in the sky for, for, for a long time, for several days actually, and kept on going, you know, trying to get a very deep image. So this shows you it's a small patch of the sky, but each of these points is a galaxy, and some of these galaxies go back, you know, to when the universe was um, maybe one tenth the size it is now, the most distant things on this image. 
Um, and that is, you know, basically, you know, 12 billion years, 10 or 12 billion years back in time. So and because the light takes that time to get to us, we're seeing these things as they were a long time ago. I mean, since then, for all we know, they're not, they could have exploded, died, whatever. We have no proof. But this is as they were a long time ago. So this tells us the universe was full of galaxies, much, some of them much like the Milky Way. But they were in place, a lot of them, a long time ago. And some of them are, are just beginning to form their first star. Some of them are chemically deficient that you know they didn't have enough exploding stars to make up all the carbon that we see in our galaxies and you can tell that from taking the the spectra of these different galaxies so that's how we piece together this part of the story and so the final missing link in seeing back into the universe came about in a slightly interesting way um, way back in 1963 um, we were just beginning to use communication satellites and so at Bell Laboratories, they um, built a, a receiver um, designed to communicate with um, this was called the Echo Satellite in those days. Um, and they demonstrated that you could basically, in principle, uh, send signals from the Earth and basically use this approach um, to transmit uh, radio telephone conversations from one point to another on the Earth, basically bouncing off a satellite. Okay, um, so technology improved, and then in 1963, the Bell people decided to retire this receiver from active working communications. They gave it to a couple of astronomers. Um, and uh, these astronomers, um, uh, Arno Penzias, Robert Wilson, um, started, they thought it'd be a great thing to map out the Milky Way galaxy. And of course, in doing so, they found that there was this weird signal from all over the sky when they subtracted off the Milky Way, there was something they couldn't explain, and this turned out to be the signal from the Big Bang. And so what, with later experiments, I mean, they just measure this at one frequency, but with later experiments, we've now realized that over the entire sky, there is a signal uh, which is very, very uniform, um, and it's the fossil radiation from the Big Bang everywhere you look in the sky. So in this sort of projection, the Milky Way would go across the center. They've taken out the Milky Way, but... Um, this is what you see, and it turns out to be equivalent to um, a, a, what we call a perfect black body signal at three degrees above absolute zero, which means it emits in the microwaves, basically. And that's what they discovered. Okay, um, and um, in, according to the, the theory of the Big Bang, um, this was produced in the universe 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Why so far away? Because then the universe was so dense uh, that the radiation could not travel freely, only as the universe expanded, and when it got to roughly this age, according to the simple theory, the universe was dilute enough so the radiation can come straight, straight towards us. So we see this radiation, this picture in the sky of this radiation. Okay, um, and it's a glimpse of the Big Bang. And then, so they, oh, Penzias and Wilson made the first measurements in 1965, and it took um, another 15 years um, with a satellite called the, um, the COBE satellite that in 1980 measured the full spectrum of the radiation, that is, at all different frequencies. So Penzias and Wilson had just one frequency, um, you know, here somewhere. Now, they measured all of these frequencies, and they found that it fit what we call a black body. Now, a black body is the radiation from a perfect furnace. And so this tells us the universe is just like the radiation, tells us the universe was just like a perfect furnace once upon a time. Now, it's obviously totally transparent. You know, there are no walls. But once upon a time, this is the relic radiation, but once was a perfect furnace when the universe was very, very dense. And, and, and the amazing thing is, the, these little points there, there are what we call error bars in physics, uncertainties, and they're multiplied by, by um, a factor of... Um, uh, 20. So th what this means is the true error bars are very tiny, invisible on this graph, and so this turns out to be the most perfect black body we can ever make, and we see it in the sky. Okay? And it tells the universe in its first years was just like a perfect furnace. Then things expanded, and we're just left with this relic from those old, old days. Okay, so um, we can't directly see back any further. Um, but there's one other thing, and though th so this was done, you know, 30 years ago when they measured this perfect radiation, but we've done one thing more recently, which again is another part of this amazing story of, again, verifying Lemaitre's model of the expanding universe. The implication is that the universe once was very hot and very dense. So it turns out to be an ideal place for exploring particle physics. So right now, we we've built this wonderful machine in near Geneva, 
uh, which is you know some 30 kilometers in, in circumference, and it consists of um, va a vacuum tunnel within which are these uh, you, you accelerate particles, um, and in one in in both directions actually they collide with each other. Um, protons and antiprotons go in opposite directions. They collide and they. And by smashing two protons together at high energy, you can learn what they're made of, basically. And that's how we discover the quarks and things like that. So this, this is the sort of event that they're looking for. Here's uh, one of the laboratories underground, um, one of these places, and, 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 in the, and in the immense array of phototubes and particle detectors, they, they look for signals like this, which track individual particles, and you're looking at collisions and all the debris that comes off. And these are debris from collisions. And this is the way you can study physics, okay, of what particles are made of. Well, the Big Bang, you can do as well, okay, because that was a, you know, you can't repeat the experiment like they do in the accelerator, but you can use the universe as, as your machine, okay, for doing this. So um, how does that work? Well, this is a sketch from Lemaitre's notebook, okay, 1927, okay? And so what Lemaitre realized was that these are different models for the expanding universe. This is the size of the universe, this is time. And so he didn't know at the time whether the universe would expand and get reach a maximum, come back, and get smaller, or expand forever. Now we believe the universe is actually going to be one of these. This is our current model of the universe, but the measure of the data, no, he couldn't distinguish between these two. But what he could say was that all of them showed that way back at the beginning, the universe went to size zero, okay? Everything we can see was in essentially, a, you know, uh, an arbitrary small volume. Now, obviously, there was no physics that he knew about or even we know about today that could understand, um, uh, tell us what this really means. But the point is there was a beginning to the universe in his theory, okay? And because it was so dense and hot then, things happened that um, we can't even begin to approach with modern particle accelerators. If you wanted to achieve the density and temperature in the universe that was, that was you know, over here somewhere near the beginning, but not quite, you'd have to build an accelerator like the one I showed you, the LHC, but that stretched all the way to the moon with superconducting magnets, et cetera, to accelerate these particles. And that's clearly beyond any ever possible budget. But the, so the universe was a place that we could do this once upon a time, or see the results of what was done once upon a time. OK, so how does all this work? What can you test? OK, so this shows you um, um, the scale of energies that are predicted by physics. OK, and so this is energy is getting higher and higher. And this, the Large Hadron Collider, this machine I just showed you, we can probe this, this over here. And right when, where we are now is at the very low energy range. And so shown on this figure are the four fundamental forces of nature. OK, so there's the electromagnetic force, which is basically controls our bodies, our chemistry, everything that we you know, except for the nuclei of, of the atoms. And the nuclei of the atoms are controlled by the nuclear forces. There's the weak force, um, which, contains radio, which controls radio decay, and the strong nuclear force. And as you go back in energy, the theory, and we've verified some of this, okay, up to this point anyway, um, predicts the forces approach each other in strength. Okay? So they become unified. So you can't tell the nuclear force from the electromagnetic force above a certain energy. And, so, and the theory predicts that as you, um, at a certain point in time, all of the nuclear forces and the electromagnetic force become unified. And so we call this, you know, this is like the holy grail of particle physics to prove this, okay? Impossible to get there. We're over here with the LHC. This is um, about, you know, several decades, six or more decades in energy beyond that. Impossible in any foreseeable time. But the universe did this once. So it's wonderful to try to use the universe to test this. Okay. Now, there's one more force, gravity, which is the weakest force of all. And that also, we think, according to theory, should become unified too. At the very beginning, when the quantum theory and gravity merge together somehow. Now, this is something we do not understand yet. There are many people that work on this. They, are, they, they do what is called string theory, among others. And I, but I put a big question mark there. But what we are sure of is that something like this must happen at an energy which um, is not challenged by our understanding of gravity, but definitely is something very, very new for particle physics. Now, the significance of how we can test this is the following. In 1980, it was realized that as the universe cools down and goes through this separation of forces, we call this a phase transition. And so we can liken this to the phase transition when ice melts on a frozen pond. 
And so we know that um, when ice melts, there's actually latent heat release. This is why fish can survive in a frozen lake. Okay? Um, it does, the whole lake doesn't freeze. There's a certain amount of heat, heat as, the, um, as the ice is melting that's released that keeps the, un, a slight temperature under the ice. So this slight energy release can be large enough. It doesn't last very long. This is when the transition is occurring. But it, it's so, it, it is so predicted to possibly be so large that it can suddenly increase the rate of expansion of the universe. So we call this inflation, this sudden increase. Okay. Um, so going, what we've learned from physics, okay, is that um, um, I, I should, you should notice that um, this is the range probed by the Large Hadron Collider. We've measured particles here, but there are, you know, between here and here, there are about um, six or seven factors of 10 energy. And so far, we don't know anything about particles in this range, okay? And we call this the desert of particle physics. There may be particles, we have no idea if there are any or not. So what we've learned from these studies is that there is this desert with no new particles yet. That may be new discoveries. We think there should be. We know that the forces are merging together to lead to what we call unification. This is the grand dream of particle physics, to unify everything. So far, we think one can understand that all the f at least three of the fundamental forces should be unified, that fourth one too probably, and we have a test of, of the unification, um, uh, what we call grand unification, and this is the test is the inflation theory, okay, which has a big impact on cosmology. So what is, that, what is that theory? Let me try to explain it in a very simple way. So the universe suddenly you know, began in some you know, rather arbitrary way with being rather chaotic and irregular. But at some point, a tiny fraction of a second after the Big Bang, and a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the Big Bang, this is, you know, this is what the theory predicts, okay? There was this enormous period of expansion, which didn't last very long, was enough to take the universe from being this very irregular in three dimensions, excuse me for the two dimensions, to become something enormously um, smooth, like a greatly expanded balloon. And if you look at a small area of this balloon, you can see it's, it's totally flat, okay? And the, Einstein talked a lot about the curvature of space, okay? Gravity um, uh, causing curvature. And the prediction of this theory is that because it's locally flat in three dimensions, this would be Euclidean geometry. It means that um, Euclid's axioms about the three angles of a triangle at 180 degrees be, must be satisfied. And so it's a prediction of this theory that space should have a certain type of geometry. A wonderful prediction, actually. Um, another prediction is the universe should be very large. Well, we haven't measured the end of it yet. That's still certainly true. And also, and this is maybe the most intriguing part of the story, is that some of these fluctuations that should, should survive into the present time and maybe be the seeds for forming the galaxies. Things are not completely smoothed out. Anyway, um, so you can see these are the two um, founding... Um, proponents of this inflation theory in 1980, Alan Guth and Andrew Linda, an American and a Russian, Russian-American. Here is an attempt to try to explain inflation, and I, it's not the easiest thing to explain, but you have to imagine, so this is the energy, okay? And we live in the low-energy universe over here. We began this high-energy universe. And so the idea is that there were some fields fields of energy, okay, that caused inflation. And things, you know, didn't change very much, and there was a, a, this phase transition. And this phase transition caused um, a huge um, um, release of energy. This, this indicates, and it ends up in the universe today, and things settle down, inflation stops. And so the universe, this trace of the size of the universe, is gradually increasing, and this enormous increase occurs. And here today we have a present universe. And you begin with something... Um, incredibly small. If I take all the matter in this universe and ask what was the size over here, it would be about the size of a P, basically, to give you some analogy. Anyway, so it's hard to explain all of this. Let me give you another visual impression. Before we have this inflation theory, um, imagine our Earth on this spiral galaxy over here, then we could, with our biggest telescopes, we can see 14 billion years, maybe, out to this distance. And, you know, there's a bit more beyond how far we can see, but this is this is we we expected this was the way the universe was of a certain you know size that someday maybe in a few billion years we'll see all the evidence to see that was the hope. Okay, but now we're just one tiny part of some truly enormous universe. It, some may say it seems, for all we know, it could be infinite. We don't know that actually, um, but anyway, so there is and 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 it may be that we will never ever ever see no matter how far in the future 
what really is out there. Okay, that's another story. Okay, so um, what we've learned then from looking at the microwave background in much more detail, I showed you how it was in, um, in 1980, so in 2016, there's been a big improvement. And so now we, we, when we look at the microwave background, we, we can see tiny fluctuations. So this is the same background I showed you, but I've taken away the smooth component. I'm just looking at the variations of a few parts in a million from place to place on the sky. And so these are regions that are slightly colder and regions that are slightly warmer. So we're looking at, and this is taken from a recent satellite. So these are, uh, and so this is a, a glimpse of the universe, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and that these are the seeds from which structure laid, you know, there were fluctuations in density as well as in radiation, and, and they accreted and the structure gradually began. So that's, a, that's our current story. Okay, um, so, we, so we say, um, where do these fluctuations come from? Well, one view is that they um, may have emerged from essentially nothing, okay? And now it's not quite nothing. Let me try to explain what nothing is. So I've actually heard a philosopher... Um, give a talk on nothing, and he spoke for two hours on nothing. So, you know, n nothing is actually very complicated. So, anyway, so in the, for the cosmology, um, you have to think of nothing. You have to Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle. The, the probably some of you may have seen the play Copenhagen, which you know one of the big issues there. Anyway, his uncertainty principle. Um, tells us that very strange things can exist if you can't actually measure them, okay? So you're limited to the smallest things you can see by the ability to measure them. And if your ability to me measure them using light, that actually um, give, gives you limited resolution because, you know, the light's got a certain wavelength. The things are smaller than that wavelength, you can never actually see it. So things can come and go in the universe on infinitesimal scales for infinite just be short times that you'd never see them, but they could really be there. So this is in nothing. And so fluctuations in nothing are predicted. And of course, if you have fluctuations, that gives you some energy, right? So even though there's nothing, this nothing has energy attached to it. Okay, so this is basically um, the energy force that's responsible for accelerating the universe. That We call that dark energy. That's another story. I won't go into that. But we think we've even measured this nothing, this, this so-called dark energy force out there. Okay, anyway, so one prediction is that particles like the Higgs bosons discovered a couple of years ago at the LHC, they're everywhere, but they come and go so rapidly we can never see them. And so these are the fluctuations in nothing. Okay, okay, so then, um, so these are what we call quantum effects, okay? And so th there are tiny fluctuations, okay? Um, but when you get inflation, that gives you a way of taking these tiny, tiny fluctuations, which are in nothing, essentially, and stretching them out, capturing them uh, onto enormous scales. So in this um, cartoon, I tried to explain how that might work. Um, you imagine this is time, and imagine this is the universe as it expands, as, as the universe you can see moves at the speed of light, and this is the physical mass that you can see in any epoch of the universe. So this, in other words, here is the universe expanding. It can never quite expand at the speed of light. It's some inertia attached to it. Then inflation occurs, and suddenly inflation takes up these tiny fluctuations and stretches them into, onto enormous scales. And then much later, that we can then see them inside our universe. And so this is a way of understanding why it is that in the universe, as we look around us, there hasn't been time for one part to see the other, but there has been, in some sense, causal contact because of, because of this, the, this inflation period. And in particular, this applies to tiny fluctuations. So what about these fluctuations? So here is the way we see those fluctuations. Again, let's go back to the microwave background. Um, so again, this tries to explain this in, a, in a, maybe a, I hope a little more clearly. Here we are, and this is the past. This, this out here is the Big Bang, okay? And this is as far as we can see the galaxies, okay, in a certain region, billions of years around us, okay. But then before the galaxies, there was what we call the dark ages. So we have the dark ages in cosmology. But there was nothing. There were no galaxies, no stars. It was dark. And then we have the radiation, and when we look at that, the microwave background radiation, we can see 380,000 years after the Big Bang. This is what we see. This is, this is where the radiation last scattered off the matter and comes straight to us. So when we look at the radiation, we see this beautiful map that refers to this surface over here. So, um, and the Big Bang happened well before that, okay? Now, if you look at a region of the sky um, where light has just communicated from some patch on the Big Bang to, to, 
to, to this last scattering region, then that turns out to be about a degree apart on the sky. So regions less than a degree have had communication since the beginning. But if you look at regions that are further apart, then if I imagine a point over here, there is no way it's past this we call the light cone, it's past light cone, could overlap with one over here. So we say these points are causally totally disconnected. And the only way you can ever connect them is by something like the inflation theory, which expands things rapidly and then explains the causal creation of the universe. So that's the story. And then when we, when we, when we analyse this, this, radi this radiation that we see, we can basically um, we, we say that on a degree or so, we're seeing stuff that's causally connected. These are the fluctuations. But above a degree, we're, we're looking at stuff that really comes back a long way from the beginning. So that's sort of the, the, the basic picture, the way we think, because we are seeing fluctuations on these scales, connected by degrees, these are many degrees, we are seeing quantum fluctuations on the sky. So that's the amazing um, um, implication. Okay, so we have the fluctuations. Now how do we make the galaxies? Okay, so this is something called gravitational stability. The idea is basically the rich get richer, the poor get poorer. So if I have a region that's slightly denser than the average, stuff will come in by gravity. If I have a region that's slightly underdense, it will tend to expand and lose and, and get larger and larger. So we call these gal galaxies or galaxy clusters, and we call the, the opposite the voids. Okay? And we see a universe full of holes, voids, and full of excess regions of density. So we're pretty sure that's what happened. Um, and then when you, um, when you go to the observations, you try to piece all this together. So here's what the theory of inflation um, tells us, that you start off with some with some fluctuations long, long ago, and the gravitational stability, this growth by gravity works and produces, um, because um, you know, today you only got limited growth of fluctuations because they're so big on the sky, they haven't had time to connect with each other very long, the smallest ones have more time. And so you predict some picture in which there are large fluctuations, and this happens to be the small sizes, here are the big ones, uh, and so these sort of win, and we have what is called a bottom-up theory of structure formation. So the universe naturally predicts, even though I, I start from complete democracy, a bottom-up, small things grow bigger and bigger, um, and that's how galaxies are made. And, and when you try to piece this together with all, the, with all the observations, indeed you find, as you go, this is the equivalent of this green line over here, this is the more accurate version, and you find at, at, every, at any point of the line there are objects like galaxy clusters, there are galaxies, even gas clouds, and on the large sky, the micro, larger scale micro background, all of which piece together, these are data points from the data, to fit this general picture. So that's why we're fairly confident we understand this notion of gravitational instability, of gravity strengthening the strong and making the structure that we see in the galaxy. So that all seems to work. So it's an amazing story, um, and what we'd like to do is to test it, okay, because... Um, um, I showed you uh, there's a lot of proof of the Big Bang, but what about testing this story of how structure is, um, is made? Okay, so the way it goes is something like this, that we can only see directly to, to this period after the Big Bang. The black body radiation, uh, because it's such a perfect furnace, actually was produced um, earlier, maybe a month after the Big Bang. Um, that, imagine, um, you know... Um, you're, you're in a fog, okay, but um, you can see they glows in the distance even though you can't see anything directly. So in some sense, the black body is like a they glow in the sky. It's perfect black body. So it takes us back further, maybe to one month. Then helium, I told you about, that's a few minutes. Um, and what we'd like to do is to go back really to the very... Can we test this? So there's one amazing test that has been predicted uh, of the theory of inflation. And the idea is that this... The universe gets so shaken up during this incredible exp expansion that it should produce gravity waves. So gravity waves were a prediction of Einstein from black holes, black holes forming or merging together. And the universe, in fact, shakes up gravity. So, and all a gravity wave is a, is a change in the gravity field propagating through space at the speed of light. So the theory of inflation predicts that this should happen. The trouble is... This happened so long ago, these gravity waves get incredibly slowed down, spread out, right? The, the wavelength is longer and longer, so they're very hard to see directly. You'd need, impossible with any 
terrestrial experiment or space experiment. You just couldn't sample a long enough range. But it turns out they do leave their imprint on the microwave background. Okay? So this is a, an amazing way to see this, and the idea goes something like this, that here is the surface of the universe as seen in the microwave background, these fluctuations from 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Um, if I have standard density perturbations, that they have a certain pattern on these fluctuations, but have gravitational waves, there's a twist. Okay? And so this twist is a signal that, in principle, we can hope to see okay, and measure. Okay, so the problem is that we've measured these, these are the, the, the these are the parents of the density fluctuations. And so these are basically uh, micro Kelvin, one millionth of a degree Kelvin. That's the sort of level these things are. To look for this signal, you have to, there are a tiny fraction of these. They're nano Kelvin of that order. Maybe You have to do maybe a thousand times better, which is very, very difficult to do. So experiments are, are underway to do a lot of this. And I'm going to just, um, I want to go through this very quickly, okay, because I want to come to the more interesting part about the metric in a moment. But anyway, so here we are, the temperature fluctuations. Uh, this, this is the beginning of the polarization story, but the ultimate one is down here. But the, and this is angle, looking at different angles in the sky, looking for these fluctuations. And the problem is, um, this is data that we have now. This is data that we may get in 10 years' time. There, there are signals on polarization that come from just dark matter, okay? And so you have to get rid of those, and ultimately what you're looking for is this tiny upturn over here, which is a signal from inflation, um, which we'll see over here somewhere, and we have to get rid of all this um, by very carefully reducing all these existing error bars. So this is something, this is a big challenge for the future, and, we, and uh, the hope is that in 10 years' time, um, although there have been false reports already, finding these things, we may find that this proof, which is these gravity waves, from inflation, which come in in the, in the micro background over here somewhere. So that's my first test of inflation. Here's another one, which maybe is a slightly more down to earth. So if this inflation story is true, it was caused by this merging of all the forces. So if I merge together the nuclear forces, it means that protons, the stuff, essential part of our bodies, are not stable, okay? They have some tiny tendency to decay. And way back when all the forces were unified, that they came and went in no time at all. But the implication is that even today, there should be a tiny, tiny uh, probability of decay. Now, just by the fact that we are sitting in this room and we're not dropping dead of cancer means that the lifetime of a po proton is limited to some fairly long time, um, actually uh, trillions of years, because there are you know, many, many atoms in our bodies, and even, even if one or two of them were decaying, we'd be in trouble. Okay? So just by the fact that we're sitting here, we can limit the proton life. To, but the theory predicts not trillions, but numbers like, um, did I even write it down, 10 to the 34 years. An enormous number. That's what the theory says. And so we have an experiment now underway using 60,000 tons of purified water. Here are the engineers going around setting up you know, a million photo tubes, one kilometer underground. And they're looking for this rare one, in a, one, one part in you know, 60,000 60, tons flash of light in the course of a year because it's so dark there. Um, that my, and they, they've found nothing so far. And they're um, building a, a large experiment in Japan, called Hyper Kamio Candy, which will have one million tons of purified water, okay, in 10 years' time. And they hope if, with this they will be able to get the more or less close to the prediction, the expectation um, of proton decay, which will be about 100 times, um, 10, is 10 or 100 times larger than this number, which is the current limit. Okay. Um, so let me finish um, by coming to a question which many people have wondered about. Uh, what happened before the Big Bang? Okay, um, okay. So, um, what did God do before He created the universe? And so, so it's said that so, Saint Augustine, he was preparing hell for people who ask such questions. <laughs> it, 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 in, in fact, this is not what he wrote. Okay, there could be no doubt that the world was not created in time, but with time. An event in time happens after one time and before another, after the past and before the future. But at the time of creation, there could have been no past because there was nothing created to provide the change and movement, which is the condition of time. Okay, this is an incredibly modern view, okay, from um, the fourth century. Let me flash forward to Lemaitre, okay? He talked about the day without yesterday, okay? 
Um, and this is what he said in um, the first instant of the bottom of space time, the now, which is no yesterday, because yesterday there was no space. So, this actually, that space is emergent, is the current view in physics, okay? Um, so, um, everything began at the beginning. And so, what this means is that we don't, it's misleading. I, I really gave you a misleading title of this talk. Um, there, there is no creation in the Big Bang theory, but there is a beginning. Okay? And so this is um, another quote from Measure. When we speak of this event as of a beginning, it is a beginning in the sense that if something happened before, it has no observable influence on the behavior of our universe. Everything happens as if the theoretical zero was really a beginning. The question if it was really a beginning or rather a creation, something started from nothing, is a philosoph philosophical question which cannot be settled by physical or astronomical considerations. And I think, you know, this is, this is generally agreed. It appeared to me there were... And how, you wonder, could he reconcile this with his faith, okay? So, again, remarkably, it appeared to me there were two paths to truth. I decided to follow both of them. And there was no coupling. Now, he had a big problem because Pius XII, in a famous encyclical in 1951, made a big deal of the fact um, that the first words of Genesis were essentially uh, corroborated by the, the Big Bang theory, okay? And the Metra had extensive arguments with him that, you know, uh, not to make much of that. And in fact, I think you, you find fiat lux only appears once in the encyclical. Okay, so, um, and the fact that there was a beginning, not a creation, you can see um, the independent got it right. Um, this was the discovery of the, the Kobe results of fluctuations. So, um, let me end with saying to understand uh, the first three minutes, the, it's hard to verify anything. We, we can hope to show that it passes all challenges and makes predictions, okay? And so what we have so far um, is the beginning of the universe, um, its size. Um, I talked about the, the space properties, Euclidean nature, the fluctuations. Um, um, what next? We, we have to find dark matter, dark energy. We have to understand why things are the way they are. Um, and the question of the multiverse, I've talked a bit about that in other lectures. Um, the new data that we're expecting uh, could be transformational. Um, we're on, on route to looking for gravity waves, proton decays, primordial black holes, all of this thing, a major components of the universe. And the final thing you can hope for is maybe someday there'll be a new theory which will enable us to understand all of this better, involving quantum mechanics and gravity. That we don't have yet, so thank you. <coughs>